Welcome to Marxist Voice, podcast of the communists in Britain. In today's episode, we'll be listening to another talk from 2023's Revolution Festival, this time on the crisis of Scottish nationalism. Almost 10 years ago, the Scottish national movement terrified the ruling class, threatened to rip apart the union and unleash the rebel spirit of the workers against Tory Britain. But today, the movement is at a crossroads. The SNP, which was raised to unprecedented levels of support by the movement, has proven politically bankrupt, and their rosy reformist image has given way to fierce attacks on the working class. As a result, those who have sobered up to the bankruptcy of petty bourgeois nationalism are looking for a way forward. In this talk, Sean Morris will explain the crisis faced by Scottish nationalism, and that the way forward for the fight for national independence lies in the class struggle. Without further ado, this episode of Marxist Voice, brought to you by the Communists in Britain. It's been kind of a slightly dramatic year, really, for Scottish politics. Normally things in Scotland are a little bit more slow-paced, a little bit more, you know, blurred around the edges and compromised, compared to the crisis that's been going on in, in Westminster, certainly, and, and uh, in UK politics as a whole, um, for the whole past, uh, past decade, but especially, you know, the past uh, five years or so. But it still has been a lot going on. So um, hopefully this will be exciting and energizing for people. Um, I'm going to start really by, by kind of talking a little bit about the, uh, the political thriller, I think, that's been kind of unfolding in Scotland uh, over this past year. But um, I think the, the, one of the greatest illustrations of the crisis that Scottish nationalism finds itself in is the fact that um, uh, the SNP they promised uh, in June of last year Nicola Sturgeon promised this, or she said it was her, her, her aim. They said there would, there would be a referendum. Um, it should have happened about a month ago, on the 19th of October, 2023. That's when they said, we're going to get this, we're going to have a, a referendum then on independence. And of course, uh, it didn't happen. In fact, uh, nothing even happened. There wasn't even much of a, a word or a celebration from the SNP about, oh, this is what we wanted to have. It was kind of just uh, buried, covered up, forgotten about. Um, this plan was, of course, famously quashed by the UK Supreme Court, basically, um, ahead of that kind of uh, legal challenge to the UK's ability to, to stop a referendum. This, that's when they announced they wanted to have this, uh, this one uh, in October of this year. Um, and then fast forward a few months from that uh, court case, uh, Nicola Sturgeon in February of this year, she resigns as First Minister and as leader of the Scottish National Party, seemingly uh, like a bolt from the blue out of nowhere. Um, her, her, you know, her, her excuse, or the, the reason she gives is like, oh, I'm just kind of tired of politics. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a brutal kind of life or whatever. I think she used that word. She said that she was like brutally uh, treated or something like that. Um, drew a lot of comparisons to like, uh, you know, Jacinda, Jacinda Ardern in, in New Zealand. You know, she resigned around the same time. Also, female leader was often compared to Nicola Sturgeon and so on. And yeah, had the exact same reason. She's like, oh. Politics is just, uh, it's just too mean, you know, it's too hard. And obviously this is just uh, entirely superficial. The real reasons go much kind of deeper than that. But as soon as uh, she um, was, uh, as soon as she resigned, um, the party, the SNP, was thrown into an extremely contentious leadership debate, which everyone maybe will have seen a little bit of or seen some of the main figures from on the news and so on, um, which exposed many of the, the fault lines that ran through the party, basically, that were, that were just below the surface, that were kind of ignored or, or really um, kind of covered up by, by Nicola Sturgeon, her own kind of personal popularity and authority. Um, the leadership uh, election really exposed to what degree her and the kind of clique around her actually held the party together. And in fact, there was a lot of acrimony and disagreement and, and, uh, and, and political disunity uh, around the party. Uh, after her resignation, yeah, there were, there were kind of you know, a couple of candidates and so on. This was supposed to be a new generation of SNP politicians um, taking over the party from, from, uh, from Sturgeon and, and the kind of clique of people who'd uh, ruled the party for, for more than 20 years. Um, and yeah, they were immediately divided over many extremely caustic issues. You know, the question of, uh, of the candidate's religion played a big part in the campaign. Um, the, uh, the controversy over transgender rights and the Gender Recognition Act in Scotland also played a huge part in it. Um, and they also uh, ended up kind of attacking each other over the party's raison d'etre, over the independence question and the fact that there was a, an impasse. Uh, and it was, I think it was extremely embarrassing for them all to, to basically have their own candidates for leadership come out and basically say, we've, we've done practically nothing. We're, we're basically where we were in 2014. We're not really any kind of closer to independence. Um, 
So this was all the, uh, the, the, the high kind of political drama that emerged, emerged around the, uh, the leadership election. But then also around the same time, um, the party was then besieged by this police investigation, which everyone will probably have seen in the headlines and so on, into the party's finances. And it's, uh, it's raked up a lot of, uh, of, of dodgy stuff, really, uh, in the party, which is obviously what the, the intention of this uh, investigation actually was, is to, to, to rake up all the, all the dark stuff that builds up in a party and in a government after it's been in government for 10 years or more than 10 years, 15 years. Um, expose the, the, the very close, uh, incestuous, really, relationship between the SNP as a party and the Scottish government, the, the, the party machine, basically, and the, the, the state bureaucracy in Holy, based around Holyrood, um, symbolized most perfectly by the actual, by the marriage between Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister and SNP leader, and uh, Peter Murrell, uh, who was uh, the SNP's kind of chief executive, the kind of top boss. Um, and all of the kind of, basically this, this power couple or whatever of Scottish politics, you know, the, the influence that they jointly had over the machinery of party and government, how they kind of merged and blurred the kind of lines and so on. As everyone knows, you know, in a, in a, in a bourgeois state, you know, there's supposed to be this formal separation of powers and, and, uh, and so on. And um, that was all kind of a, you know, very blurry and, uh, and it, it threw a lot of kind of a, a big kind of shadow over Holyrood and so on. Uh, the lack of the complete lack of transparency in the Scottish National Party's uh, own finances was 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 the main feature of this uh, investigation. The main thing that's kind of come out, like I said, all the kind of strange, dodgy stuff, like this um, uh, motorhome. This is a luxury motorhome that cost one hundred thousand pounds or something like that. That was purchased by the party in, before 2020. It was meant to be some sort of SNP battle bus or something like this, but it never got any use. Uh, as an official SNP campaigning vehicle that was owned by the party. Uh, and in fact, it sat for more than 12 months in the driveway of Peter Murrell's 92-year-old mother. Um, and uh, it was reported, you know, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the question basically is, did, did Peter Murrell and Nicholas Sturgeon, did they make personal use of this vehicle, which was you know, paid for by the party um, for their own kind of uh, holidays and so on? Um, the question of like expenses. The the main thing was about uh, about independent you know uh, donations to the party for campaigning for independence, uh, and then also things like uh, you know Peter Murrell the loans that he personally had made to the party to cover its uh, financial uh, uh, yeah, difficulties basically, and how much money the party owed to him personally and all this sort of stuff. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the, the party's finances were in such a bad state that uh, it was revealed, you know, uh, the, the company that was supposed to be auditing the, the party, um, they, they, they quit and they said they wouldn't do it, basically. And, and there was a scramble earlier this year for the SNP to desperately find some accountancy firm, a legitimate one, um, that uh, would audit the party's accounts in time for this, this deadline for the Electoral Commission or else they would face an even bigger investigation, potentially, or, or deregistration. Um, and it revealed... Uh, in particular, at, right around the time of the leadership election as well, which was extremely embarrassing for the party, the financial crisis that the SNP um, was in, having lost um, around 40% of its membership since 2019, a huge number of people drifting out of the party, basically, and, uh, and the consequent loss of uh, you know, membership dues and also uh, less donations and all that kind of stuff, basically. Um, as part of this investigation, you know, senior figures, including Sturgeon, you know, she was uh, arrested and questioned, um, though nobody was actually charged with any kind of crime. And there was, yeah, huge publicity around the case um, and a lot of kind of odd behavior uh, around it, I think. And, and you know, it's it kind of uh, taken the piss out by a lot of people. You know, the police investigation, you know, their raid on, S on the SNP headquarters and on Nicola Sturgeon's uh, home. Um, they seized things like Nicola Sturgeon's personal shaving razor, and uh, other personal items that were taken as evidence somehow of financial crime, white collar crime. And uh, the, the, the scenes themselves were ridiculous. You know, her, her house had all these forensic tents, dozens of police officers. It was like a, you know, a serial killer had lived there or something like that. <laughs> not, the, uh, not someone who's accused of, um, yeah, like I said, a, a kind of white collar crime of uh, you know, financial impropriety or whatever. Um, and uh, it seems pretty likely, really, that the whole investigation, like I said, no one has actually been charged. The whole investigation is uh, what they call, I think, legally vexatious. There's no real basis to it. Um, it's politically motivated, in other words. Um, and it really, you know, it isn't even really clear what crimes have been committed. Like I said, no one's been charged. Yes, there's a lot of dodgy stuff with the SNP party finances, but what bourgeois party does not have 
dodgy financial uh, a dodgy fin financial record that they cover up you know and uh, it's purely because the S&P are the S&P that they're facing an investigation like this you know people might remember it was the uh, the leave campaign in the 2016 referendum they broke all the rules about spending and you know finances and whatever else but they faced you know basically no kind of uh, no kind of consequences um, not like uh, how the S&P are, are being um, investigated anyway um, it seems like this uh, you know, what's the reason for all this? Like, I think the, the Tories the, were emboldened by the SNP's loss at the Supreme Court last year. Um, you know, and, uh, and, but they could still see, you know, Nicola Sturgeon, you know, in response to this, talked about, you know, this uh, plan for a de facto referendum at the next general election. So they probably felt that they needed to do something um, and try and keep the SNP on a, on a short leash, basically. Um, and there's a lot of other things that they did, you know, they, uh, Around the same time, this diktat from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office went out to all Scottish politicians and ministers, basically saying that uh, you know you're no longer allowed to take like foreign trips to different countries and present yourselves as representing the Scottish government, um, and to talk to foreign leaders about uh, about you know the potential of Scotland becoming an independent country. Which since uh, Alex Salmond's day, you know, there's, there's been a network of Scottish uh, I don't know what they're called like development offices or something like that set up in, in various countries to try and attract investment directly via the, the devolved government into Scotland but um, they said you can't do that anymore this is a violation of, uh, of uh, this is overstepping the bounds basically um, and they also uh, announced that they might investigate the Scottish government for uh, the amount of money that it spends on independence campaigning again they would make the argument that this is illegal, basically. The Scottish government can't spend money on breaking up the UK state because it's just a, it's a devolved part of the UK state. Um, and uh, it's not, you know, saying, oh, it shouldn't have, there shouldn't be like a Scottish government minister for independence as there is, there shouldn't be a Scottish government minister for like foreign affairs, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this probe into the SNP finances has been open since 2021. Um, and it's initially based on, it seems, the complaint lodged by one pro-independence uh, crank, basically, this guy, Sean Merkin, who's just a bit of a lunatic, basically, hits the SNP, he's just this whole petty border nationalist, whatever. Yeah, he, he lodged this complaint with the police like two years ago into this uh, 600,000 pounds that just had sort of disappeared from the SNP accounts um, that, was, that was meant to be ring fence for independence campaigning. Um, and like nothing happened in this investigation for two years until, like I said, that loss at the Supreme Court and Nicola Sturgeon talking about a de facto referendum. I think it's when this was all kind of put, moved into, into order. Um, and it's completely within the powers of the, uh, the Home Secretary to have ordered this. You know, they you know, protest and say this is like a Scottish police investigation. Um, but uh, the National Crime Agency, which is a bit like the UK's version of the FBI, are the ones that have actually been doing much of the investigating on this and, of course, sharing resources with, with um, you know, the National Crime Agency works on organised crime and that kind of thing and works closely with Police Scotland, which is the UK's second largest police force. So, a bit of a conspiracy, I guess, is what I'm sort of saying. But uh, whether it is a conspiracy or not, um, the damage is done, basically, to the SNP by this whole scandal. Um, they've dropped around like 10%, you know, in the opinion polls. Um, and there's a widespread perception amongst the party membership, supporters and, and, and voters more generally that the party is in, is in a deep crisis. Uh, it's losing its direction and in fact that it may have entered like a phase of, of decline. It's kind of years of, of absolute dominance in the ballot box are, are kind of over and, uh, and now it's being kind of cut down to size. And it looks like that the Labour Party, the Scottish Labour, are kind of stanced up and ready to give the SNP a, a body blow really at the next election. Um, it's the kind that won't knock the SNP out. You know, I think they'll still be the, the largest party in Scotland for, for years to come. Um, but they'll certainly be down on one knee if they lose a significant number of seats, either at Westminster or even opinion polls are now showing that the SNP would maybe lose a significant number of their seats at the Holyrood uh, election as, as well for, for the Scottish government. And, um, you know, people may have seen, you know, uh, you know, two months ago, wherever it was, they've already faced a big defeat in the, the Rutherglen, this by-election that happened just in the kind of south, the east of Glasgow. Um, and the party is now, you know, very, very vulnerable, I think, to scandals. There's a real lack of enthusiasm amongst the party's, uh, you know, support base. And I think that was the, what, what caused the result that happened in Rutherglen, which was a, you know, 
in, in pure numerical terms, it was a big landslide for the Labour Party, but it's basically because thousands of pro-SNP voters seemingly just didn't even show up to vote for the party. Um, and, uh, and, you know, why would they? There were all kind of reasons why. But, you know, the SNP, they, they looked unbeatable, I'd say, you know, just uh, over a year ago still. Um, uh, but how, you know, and why, and why is this happening now? Why, why such a, a sudden kind of decline and, and crisis? You know, this isn't just a, a bolt from the blue, I would say, but it's a result of the kind of contradictions that have been building up in Scottish politics and in, and in the SNP um, over the whole kind of past period, basically, since the last referendum and, and, uh, and even going back a little bit further, basically. I think the first thing really to understand about the crisis of Scottish nationalism is that it's a, a crisis of reformism, basically. So we'll get on to that. You know, the SNP, they've been in power for 16 years now, a long, long time. Um, they maintained high levels of, uh, of support, you know, uh, at the ballot box, uh, especially since the 2014 independence referendum. Um, you know, they got there after a kind of steady rise, you know, of about 20 years, with, like I said, many of the, the same people at the kind of top of the party for that whole time since the 1990s. Um, People like uh, Alex Salmond, uh, John Swinney, Peter Murrell, Nicholas Sturgeon, and uh, Angus Robertson. Um, and I think it's just Robertson who remains basically in the in the, the kind of upper stratum of the party now, and he's um, you know likely to probably leave uh, soon enough. Um, <clears throat> And um, and of course everyone knows, and it was after 2014 in the independence referendum when there was a you know a huge sea change in, in Scottish politics, and the SNP became a, a genuinely kind of mass political party. Um, you know, thousands of people applied to join. For a few years, I think it was you know per capita the second largest political party in the world. Something like one in ten people in Scotland were a member of the Scottish National Party. The only party that beat them in the world was uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, on that statistic. Um, but this uh, this generation of like Sturgeon and, and so on, you know, like they were the ones that succeeded in winning that mass support from the SMB, but largely by posing just to, to the left of the Labour Party, basically. Uh, it, was, it was Labour's, uh, Labour's difficulty it was the SNP's opportunity. Um, you know, they, in the early 2000s, they were very opposed to Tony Blair and to, you know, to the Iraq war and so on. Um, and they have put forward a uh, kind of program, you know, of uh, of kind of ref you know reformism, social democratic reformism, whatever, um, through uh, at Holyrood through the devolved Scottish Parliament. You know, they proposed things like abolishing council tax and replacing it with a more fair, like local income tax or property tax, or this kind of stuff. You know, very pro NHS, all this kind of stuff, basically. You know, kind of posing very much uh, to the left of the of the Labour Party. I mean, the SNP itself goes all the way back to, uh, to the 1930s as a political party. Um, I mean, Scottish nationalism, I mean, whatever, you could, you, could, you could date it even further back, but that's when it became a, a kind of organized force. Um, and the SNP, I mean, it always did have a, a left wing, I guess, within it, um, but historically it was very much dominated by, by its right wing, by the kind of, uh, the, the sort of the traditionalists, the, the tartan Tories, as they were kind of known, especially in the 1980s. Um, who were just kind of like the, the sort of straight nationalists, you know. Um, they even, many of them opposed devolution. They just want, they didn't want that as a halfway house. They wanted independence or nothing. And um, on the basis of, uh, you know, oil wealth and this kind of stuff. And like I said, they were, they were quite right-wing right and, and pro-capitalist. Um, and that was what kind of kept the party quite marginal for much of its history, I think. Because um, the, uh, the Scottish working class was, uh, you know, I think very much kind of tied to you know, to unionism, I mean, not unionism necessarily, but, you know, against independence, um, through the Labour Party, essentially. Um, and it was the breakage of this link, you know, between the Scottish working class and Labour that, you know, opened up the possibility of this growth of Scottish nationalism, really, um, is what gave rise to the SNP. Like I said, adopted this kind of Labour-like, social democratic reformist kind of platform in the sort of 1990s. Um, and it was, you know, as a result of generations of betrayal of the, the Labour right wing, you know, from Kennick to Blair and so on to Brown, even, you know, the last Scottish Labour, 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 uh, leader of the uh, Labour Party, um, that saw vast uh, swathes of, of, of working class um, voters and, and people, you know, turn their back on Labour basically kind of once and for all in, you know, 2014, 2015. It was the 2015 general election when you had that massive landslide basically towards the SNP. One and a half million people voting SNP in Scotland, which was a historically, you know, high, massive mandate basically. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this, this 
sudden shock, you know, was not, again, not something just kind of randomly happened, but it was a result of that years, a culmination of years of decline for, for Labour in Scotland, you know, losing to the SNP, basically losing support to the SNP. Um, you know, a few years ago, Boris Johnson, um, he was in a way correct. He was caught in one of his famous hot mic moments, you know, speaking his, his, his true thoughts, uh, you know, when he didn't realize people were recording him. Um, he was correct in a way when he said that uh, devolution was Tony Blair's biggest mistake. You know, that's what he said, basically, you know, basically railed against Holyrood and against devolution, said it was all, it was all a big mistake. Um, it's true because, you know, the, the creation of Holyrood and the, uh, of the Scottish Parliament um, only really allowed, you know, the SNP and Scottish nationalism to, to gain a little bit of a foothold and to, to compete against Labour in this, uh, this kind of space. Um, and eventually re replace, you know, the Labour Party, essentially. Um, because the Labour Party, the, the Labour left and right, you know, they supported devolution for, you know, m most of the 20th century, or home rule, I guess it was called, to try and cut across Scottish nationalist sentiment um, and, uh, you know, provide like a middle tier of um, the, the British government, the British state that was not, you know, based all the way down in, you know, here, I guess, in Westminster or in London. Um, but the result instead was not to cut across nationalism, but uh, you know, just provided a space for it to grow um, and, and an increase in it, and um, and all the the resulting kind of constitutional crises that have been over the past couple of years, conflicts between Holyrood and Westminster over who has powers over what and so on, the very ill-defined nature of the, of the British constitution, you know, uh, uh, also plays a part in this. Um, but the SNP, like I said, they were brought to power off the bankruptcy of the Labour right wing. Um, it is a very similar process that you know, brought uh, Jeremy Corbyn to lead the Labour Party, of course, uh, the kind of identical sort of political change in, in consciousness and so on. Um, but in Scotland, this was expressed uh, a bit earlier, you know, like I said, in 2014, um, as a, a rise in support for independence and, and, uh, and for the Scottish National Party. Um, before most people, I think, even knew who you know, Jeremy Corbyn was, uh, is, is when this happened. Um, but the SNP, uh, unlike Jeremy Corbyn, um, they've actually been in government for a, for a whole kind of period, whole kind of time. They've had the responsibility, the reins, basically. Um, and they're now, I'd say, very tainted by this, uh, this 16 years plus uh, in power. Um, because they, you know, they are now the, the, the establishment, basically. You know, in 2014, part of their huge appeal, or in the 2015 election, the part of their huge appeal was the SNP. They, they seem to be like a, a radical, like anti-establishment party. But now I, I don't think anyone really thinks and looks at them in, in that kind of way. They most certainly are the, uh, the establishment in, in Scotland, politically speaking. And, um, you know, over the years in government, they built, you know, a very close relationship to, to big businesses in Scotland, you know, big business or the, the, the big bourgeois, you know, companies or whatever in, in Scotland. Um, they're kind of sketchy on independence, you know, they don't actually support it, they're not really certain about it. Um, but they certainly favour the SNP as it's kind of a, you know, pro, very pro-EU position, for example, you know, they were against Brexit and Scotland, itself, you know, overall voted uh, against Brexit. And um, uh, and uh, they're very much in favour of you know, the the kind of Holyrood uh, gravy train that exists as well. All the kind of lobbying and secret meetings and all that kind of stuff. It's a uh, it's another uh, source for them. Um, so around around the party, you see at their conferences, you know, there's lots of lobbyists from from finance, from the little bit of manufacturing that still exists in Scotland, uh, and then from energy production in particular. You know, oil and gas. But also renewables are, are a real big uh, growing kind of industry, and in food and drink and so on. And the party itself, uh, it's uh, you know, it's economic, I guess, strategy uh, for the, for all these years has been you know trying to seek uh, foreign direct investment you know into Scotland. So through all kinds of schemes, you know, these uh, free ports, for example, or green free ports as they're branded to make them sound a bit nicer. Um, which we know what these are. These are just kind of concessions to big international corporations where they don't have to pay like VAT or any other kind of things like this. Um, workers' rights will probably be much lower and stuff like that. It basically allows them to have a you know, higher rate of kind of exploitation in this little kind of port. And um, Scotland gets a little bit of benefit, you know, a little bit of kind of maybe tax revenue that they otherwise wouldn't get. That's, um, that's kind of what the, the SP is uh, kind of based around now. You know, all their policies. Um, are basically uh, created by you know financial consultants that are based uh, around you know Edinburgh Edinburgh's kind of big banks and so on. These like Charlotte Street Partners, for example, is a big uh, 
uh, accountancy firm that's very, very close to the party in, in, in every way, personally, politically, with the top people and everything like that. Um, they, uh, they draft much of the SNP's uh, you know, uh, prospectuses that they make about independence. The Growth Commission report that they released a few years ago, for example, was written by Charlotte Street Partners, this kind of stuff. Um, and all this uh, makes it very, very clear. You know, we should, very, we should be, have to be clear, as Marxists, of course, about the class nature of the SNP as a party. It is a petty bourgeois liberal nationalist uh, party. Within it, you know, there's a, a kind of balance, basically, between the, the petty bourgeois, or I guess, you know, kind of bourgeois, maybe in a Scottish context, uh, sort of middle class, um, balance between them and, and then this big working class support base, you know, that exists that is, is very much more to the left and so on. And all throughout the years at various conferences and stuff like that, there's been tension essentially between this, represented by, you know, a bit of a break between, you know, the leadership and, uh, and the kind of mass membership over a couple of questions here or there, you know, like land reform and the Growth Commission report, for example, about independence, these kind of things. Um, but the balance in, within the party is very much definitely tipped in favour of the bourgeois, uh, petty bourgeois leaders. Um, they have, uh, they, you know, they basically have free kind of, kind of free hand. There's not much left opposition really within the party. Um, and of course, they're explicitly pro-capitalist and, and whatever else. You know, they work within the limits of capitalism. Thankfully, though they are reformist, liberals, and so on, there's not very many SNP politicians who who abuse the term socialism and try and pretend that they're socialists. That's a relief. Um, but really what's happening now is they're facing a, a crisis of their own reformist uh, limitations, namely the, the, the basis for the kind of reformist program that they carried out over the past uh, couple of years, very, very limited reformism, might I say. Um, the basis for that has been like, completely eroded you know, by the, the, well, the long-term you know, crisis of capitalism that uh, has existed, but also the more recently, the, obviously the more acute kind of crisis since kind of, uh, you know, 2019, basically. Um, so Hamza Youssef, who's the new Scottish uh, you know, First Minister, well, I guess he's been in power for like six months or something, but, um, you know, he, he came to power implementing austerity cuts worth, you know, billions of pounds to the Scottish budget. Um, to, to health and to education, these areas that the SNP say they champion and want to protect, in particular facing kind of huge cuts. Um, and really this is, uh, it's not a change, you know, this is the same that was proposed under Sturgeon in the budget last year. Um, but what's different now is that they can no longer really hide this austerity, which have, they have been carrying out for, for you know, the whole period that we've had austerity in Britain since um, the last kind of big financial crisis in 2008. Um, but they, uh, yeah, they can no longer hide this kind of ugly truth, really, behind all the kind of piecemeal reformist policies that the that the SNP would 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 present as their as their you know uh, as their main kind of platform. You know, these bits and pieces they've done here and there. People maybe know about like the baby box program, which is about intended to help new mothers. Um, you know, extra you know, benefit payments. You know, the SNP was against the bedroom tax, for example. People remember that one, um, and they're against universal credit and so on. Um, there's extra, you know, you can get more free childcare hours in Scotland. Prescriptions are free. Another kind of thing that they they opposed is, is prescription charges. And there's there's more, you know, there's a greater range of um, there's more expanded provision of like uh, school meals and things like this. All these little kind of, you know, welfareist uh, elements of the British state that exist. You know, they they boost kind of very slightly, and that and um, that's they've been able to hide behind that basically. But essentially, what I mean by the, the whole basis for this is eroded is that all these things that I've just mentioned, you know, are, are some like the prescription charges, whatever, more than 10 years old now. They've run out of things that are cheap or free, basically, to do. And they have much less money to work with when it comes to like funding the NHS, funding expanded childcare or, 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 or um, you know, improving the education system or whatever else. Uh, due to the global economic crisis, um, like I said, especially after it, um, if it takes a kind of, it took a deeper turn in kind of 2016 to 2019. You know, that was when all this really began to dry up, and you had all kinds of um, uh, reformist policies being promised by the SNP that they never even followed up with. You know, they talked about we should have a public energy company, never did anything about that, all this sort of stuff. Um, so it's reformism without reforms. You know, is, is what we could say. Um, and the same kind of reformism the reform, refor, uh, without reforms that led to the failure, I'd say, of uh, Syriza and like Podemos and these other, you know, kind of populist, uh, you know, groups that sprung up to the left and outside of the traditional, um, you know, social democratic parties in Europe. 
Now, of course, the S&P for all this and for the austerity and all the cuts that they implement, they, uh, they put all the blame on Westminster, as you would expect. They say it's not us, you know, we're just the middleman. Which, you know, really reduces, I think, you know, as it has reduced, especially after the, the, the contentious leadership debate and everything like that, has reduced, like, people's perceptions of, like, Holyrood, you know, from the national parliament of the Scottish people to, you know, essentially just to, a, like, a middleman. It's, it's, it's like a kind of council of councils, you know. If you imagine, like a, like, a local council debate where they argue about, you know, cutting the budget and they just say, oh, it's not us, it's the government and so on. They do the same thing and, and all the kind of same, um, uh, you know, arguments and stuff pop up. But they put all the blame in Westminster. They say Scotland needs independence to not have this, aust this austerity policy. But obviously that just begs the question then, does it not? Uh, what are you actually doing about that? What are you actually doing to, to fight Westminster and to help Scotland become an independent country? And they have no answer is, the, is, the, is their problem. They have no real answer. They have nothing concrete, nothing practical or, uh, uh, or even inspiring just to, to, to say about this. You know, they, the, the Westminster control, you know, they say they're subjected to, you know, just excuses their kind of austerity and uh, the, the attacks that they make on, on like workers' living standards um, uh, at this time. Now, the SNP's campaigning for independence is really like uh, completely bankrupt, especially at this stage. It's been a long time coming. It's been, you know, slowly unfolding, basically. Um, they were handed a really predictable defeat, I think, last November in the Supreme Court. I think... You know, the SNP, the Scottish government, they fought to, to stop their legal advice being released to the press. I think very likely because their lawyers probably all told them, you have no chance, you're going to lose this case, i.e. you're just wasting taxpayer money to make a, you know, a, a political point that um, didn't even really help the party that much. Um, and uh, the, the idea that Nicola Sturgeon then came up with after that of like a de facto referendum, not very bold policy, I think, but uh, slightly bolder than what they were talking about before. But uh, it was very clearly not supported by the party hierarchy. You know, um, people around Nicola Sturgeon didn't really come out and support it. It was very clear that they didn't view it as like legitimate, and so the plan has kind of uh, has kind of died to death. And and you know, Hamza Youssef is trying to hold on to it in a slightly distorted way. But the, there's not a real commitment or idea that at the next election, UK general election, it's going to be a de facto referendum. They've, they've essentially abandoned that idea. Um, before they ever really, um, you know, uh, planted their flag in it. Um, they're really back to square one when it comes to their independent strategy of asking the Tories for permission, you know, please give us this referendum. And of course, all they need to do is say no, you know, and, and then that's it. That, that's the be all and end all, really. They have no cards left in their hand, really, to play any kind of legal maneuver. Um, any, they, they don't even really have any... Uh, you know, any plan to try and pressure the UK government in any kind of way. You know, they don't arrange big protests and demos and whatever else. Oh man, we're getting uh, <laughs> um, I'll try and skip through the rest of this quickly. Um, we'll not skip through, but... But um, all these repetitive false starts to the campaign and so on over the, over the very many years, I've lost count of how many times, you know, the SNP, usually in the build-up to an election, would uh, come out and say, like, this is it. This is the, ha you know, the, the campaign starts now. Everyone get together give us all your emails and phone numbers and personal data into this website and we're going to start the campaign and then of course nothing happens but then on election day you get a message from the SNP not from you know yes Scotland or whoever the campaigning on saying oh yeah but you signed up come and vote for us and whatever uh, many times they did this these kind of false starts these uh, relaunches big graphics and whatever it was all extremely shallow it was all forgotten about in a matter of months basically when they, when they uh, it was just to try and you know rally the troops basically uh, no not a real serious or sincere attempt to start a campaign or anything like that um, and now they, they they're, they're on the same path really that they were before under Sturgeon you know of they're they're just content to, to continue to like issue these very uninspiring uh, reports and programs about you know independent Scotland about how much fairer and better everything would kind of be and it's all just kind of pie in the sky stuff you know it's just the all, all the most kind of random and uh you know popular trendy rather um you know, left reformist policies you can think of universal basic income blah 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 all that stuff is just included in these reports and, and none of it makes uh, makes for inspiring reading and yeah we're really no closer than we were in 2014. The, the movement itself now is, is largely very demobilized, I would say. There are not really huge independence rallies that exist anymore that have a, that have a broad um, attendance. Um, and I'd say the SNP leaders now, it becomes clear to not just ourselves as, as Marxists, but I think many people in the movement, 
that the S&P leaders, they see their role not so much as to actually uh, get things going, like to try and rouse the Scottish people to fight for independence, but in fact to restrain them, to restrain the movement and to, to, to keep it into channels of supporting the S&P at elections and blah, blah, blah. I think a lot of people will now see, that, see it that way. Um, I think a sign of, a sign of the, the state, really, of the movement was just a month ago, the SNP, they did have, they did call their first independence rally that they have done for years and years. But it was basically just a, a, a pro-EE rally. It was just a big Ramona jamboree. Um, it, you know, it was just an appeal. They've lost any kind of appeal to actually kind of, or, or they, they've, they've drained any appeal to sort of radical change out of their, their, their program for independence. And instead, they're just appealing to like an alternative status quo. You know, wouldn't it be better if we were back in the EU? Which is totally, it's just a utopian fantasy. Scotland will never join the EU again. And the only people who come out to these like big rallies are, you know, like I said, middle class Ramoners with these horrid flags of the, the Scottish Saltire with the EU stars around it and whatever else. Um, they're just, and they all of them, they just, they just are like, they're just flag wavers. And, and importantly, a lot of them are people who have been nationalists for their whole lives. They're not people who had a big change in consciousness after the last referendum. They are just people who are nationalists by and large. A lot of them are older. There's not many young people at these rallies anymore. Um, so that's the second thing to understand about the crisis of Scottish nationalism is, is the bankruptcy and the cowardice and uh, what Trotsky, I think, would have called the parliamentary cant of um, the bourgeois nationalists, basically. They're, they're no-hopers, really, when it comes to fighting for um, their, the independence of their country. They're totally averse to any kind of serious uh, political struggle that goes outside the narrow limits set by the British Constitution. Uh, you know, they won't do anything to jeopardize their, their cozy relationship that they have with, with business, international business and domestic business. Um, and their entire strategy revolves around trying to seek legitimacy, not in the eyes of poor and downtrodden people, um, but in the eyes of the, the international bourgeoisie, basically. They just want the EU to somehow lean on Britain, I don't know how, and say, oh yeah, by the way, we, you, know, you should let Scotland have a referendum or something. And of course they seek uh, in other ways, you know, the, in the past, they were um, they had an anti-NATO position that would change under Alex Salmond, and then more recently with the invasion of Ukraine, the party is like 100%, you know, pro-imperialist, backing uh, NATO in in Ukraine and so on. Um, and you know, they're wedded to this idea, you know, the the S and P, the, the Scottish nationalists, really, of of the, of the idea that like, there'll just be a gradual, you know, progress towards independence and so on. This kind of gradualism. But I think if they were honest, they would admit that um, independence is a long way off. Um, but they, but they have to pretend, you know, they have to pretend that it's something that could happen, well, yeah, next year and so on, in order to keep their, you know, to keep this this mass base of of, of working class people that support them kind of energized and, and and pulled around the party, and you know, you can only do that for so long before people see through it, and that's that's what's happening really. Um, yeah, few, few trust this, and you see that in the opinion polling. There's this decoupling, as they call it, I don't know why, but um, between the SNP support and uh, support for independence, you know, the, the yes and the SNP opinion polling. Um, it shows really, I think that in particular, that this SNP crisis has not severed the, uh, the connection between the working class and, and independence. You know, there's still, uh, they kind of take it for granted to support independence really. Um, it still has a lot of support, independence, uh, amongst, you know, class conscious, advanced workers, amongst young people. Um, like I said, they kind of take it for granted really. If you meet a young person, like, if, if, if we came out and sort of launched into some big argument like against independence or something, like the Communist Party, for example, do, um, it just is a big turnoff because it's just seen as like a, you know, a, a stereotypically unradical position is to, is to support the UK state and to be against independence, for example. Um, but, um, and I think it's clearly that it is a question, however, um, that is, um, it is kind of receding in a lot of workers' minds, the advanced working class. Um, the economic and industrial struggles that have unfolded the past couple of years, all the strikes, the cost of living crisis and so on, is much more kind of pressing and has, and has moved to the forefront of people's minds. And independence is, being, is, is viewed as something that's a bit more, bit more long term now, really. Um, it seems to be totally stuck at this impasse, basically. And, uh, and uh, they, can, they can see that the S&P, the, the bourgeois nationalists, have no way to get beyond this impasse of the Tories say, no referendum, no independence, it's not going to happen. And they have literally no way to, to, to get around that or no way to, to change that kind of a, that veto. Um, 
and it seems that it's increasingly kind of divorced from from the lives of of, uh, of working people. Um, and many people in the Yes movement, the independence movement, have kind of said as much. You know, back in 2014, what gave the the independence movement and, and campaign such a broad base was there were little local groups of people founded everywhere. Every little town and village um, had a uh, Yes hub or something like this. And a lot of those groups don't exist now. And, and it was last year that one of the uh, I mean, it wasn't, I don't think it was one of the biggest ones, but it was Yes Ayrshire, which is a traditionally much more kind of pro-union area. So I think they gained a lot of prestige in the independence movement. But um, they basically, uh, or Airdrie rather, not Ayrshire, but they, they basically said, we're wrapping it up. Like, you know, we're gonna suspend our campaigning. We're gonna suspend this group because speaking to people on the street about independence, you know, people just don't see the connection any you know, more between campaigning for independence and improving their, their, their kind of immediate, I guess, situation. Um, so they said people are much more worried about that kind of stuff and, and, and there needs to be a, a, a re-convalescence uh, or whatever of, of those kind of questions of, of, of the, the aspirations and uh, the, the needs of working class people and, and, this, and the possibility of independence. Um, and like on that question, you know, the crisis of, of Scottish nationalism is also a crisis of, of its left as well as, as its right, as well as the kind of bourgeois nationalists and so on, the big, the kind of big ones. You know, they're unable to find this. There is, like, like I said, a left wing within the SNP, but they're unable, they've been proven unable to find any kind of organized outlet or to crystallize or in anything in particular over the years. In fact, many of them, any of the groups that did exist in the SNP to its kind of left, like there was a there was a kind of anti-NATO campaign. Um, there was this group called Common Wheel and things like this. And there were a few kind of people, na big names like George Caravan and um, and a few others. They all uh, they all jumped ship a few years ago out of the SNP to join Alex Salmond's Alaba Party, which is just a you know Alex Salmond is he, he again paints himself as to the left of the SNP and as Alaba does, but he is just a complete bourgeois opportunist, you know. Um, but they very foolishly decided to go and lump themselves in with, with him and his, his little party, Alba. Um, and then some others, many others, are trying to seek shelter basically in, in the Green Party, which is a Scotland's other you know, pro-independence party that has some, has, uh, some purchase. Um, but we all know, I think, here in this room, how useless like, the Green Parties are. Um, and especially the, the Scottish Green Party, they just are, they're just clones basically of the SNP. Um, they just follow their line completely. And then the Scottish Socialist Party, which uh, was historically, you know, had representation in Scottish Parliament and so on. You know, it still exists, but it is, uh, it is a reformist sect now that is spinning its tires. Uh, you know, uh, it, they're, they're not really going anywhere. Um, so the working class is unable, basically, to, to assert itself, assert its interests in this movement that's been kind of blocked and prevented. Um, so the petty bourgeois elements, you know, are, are like completely dominating, I would say, at this, at this stage. Um, and the SNP, you can see that, is chock full of the most repellent careerists you could ever imagine. Um, people much worse than, than even like the Blair years, I would say. Um, especially the party youth, it seems, like the Young Scots for Independence. They are all extremely pro-NATO. Right now, they're all extremely pro-Israel, all this kind of stuff. And they're, they're all quite horrible, you know, briefcase bearing, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, I'd say a lot of class conscious voters are thus, as we saw in Rutherglen, which is historically a working class, much you know, deprived, kind of poor area, historically labor supporting, switched to the SNP. Um, you can see them deserting the party, I think, you know, not to go back to labor necessarily, but just to say, you know, what is the point? And with this Rutherglen election, you know, the BBC, I remember watching a little bit of their, their, their coverage of it uh, before the election. You know, normally when you see these BBC or, or Channel 4 or whatever, stuff and they go to some constituency that's having a by-election or whatever else they all they, they somehow find every, like every, the most petty bourgeois like reactionary people or whatever you know shopkeepers market sunday traders and whatever and ask them and, and portray them as like the common man or whatever when really they're just like the one you know mental guy who rants about immigrants or whatever mm -hmm. in the pub um but they actually seem to in this this little piece get working class people because it was kind of strange like one was a woman who was just like hanging out of her window like cleaning her windows and things like this and uh, and people like that and they all seem to just express that they were just like well, well I don't really see what's the point of me going voting for the S&P or Labour they're basically kind of the same now um, and, 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 and very I think it's very consciously very conscious uh, saying you know, it doesn't really matter who you vote for like you know all these kind of parties they promise this and that and whatever but like at the end of the day you know, you don't get to vote on what actually happens, like the actual policies that are decided or implemented, you know. And that 
feeling of, you know, of, of democratic kind of disenfranchisement, I think is very, very powerful. It was a part of the, the, part of the, the factor that led to the rise, I'd say, of Scottish nationalism, is this idea that you know, Scotland, we always vote for the Labour Party, but then England is much bigger and votes for the Conservative Party, so we get Conservative governments, so there's this democratic deficit and so on. I think that kind of feeling is, is still kind of existing there, but it's now just directed against all, all the political parties and against the, the system generally, I'd, I'd say. Um, so at the minute, I would say, um, I'm about to conclude. From the ruling class point of view, I think they've got the SNP under control, basically, for the, for the meantime. Um, it's not really a serious threat in the short term that's going to upset anything. Um, I think the big, the serious bourgeois, and even the slightly less serious ones in Downing Street, um, I think they can see that the SNP leaders themselves are not actually that serious about breaking up Britain about actually fighting in any kind of way for uh, independence. Which is not to say that they're not still a thorn in their side. I think they, they definitely are and still will be. Um, because independence it still represents a kind of long-term strategic instability for the British state. Um, so they still have, the, so there's still a necessity of kind of combating it um, in various ways, which, which the current government, the Tory government does. Um, but, uh, you know, they saw through the whole, um, drama of, of Brexit, there's, there's multiple years of just chaos and whatever, um, and also during the, the pandemic as well, that uh, it, it is a complicating factor for them, you know, it represents a kind of um, a, another axis of contradiction within the general kind of crisis of British capitalism that, that, could, that can exacerbate and make things worse and, and make, make any kind of solution difficult or make any kind of solution just something that produces is further problems. Um, so I think really the um, the question for like in, in Scotland right now, anyway, it seems like I think the next uh, the next phase or the next big kind of movement, perhaps, of, of the kind of class struggle, it may not break about break out as a result of the national question directly. You know, I think um, though it will no doubt impact whatever way, um, uh, whatever for exact form you know the, the class struggle takes in Scotland. Um, but it's uh, you know it's Scotland and, and the Scottish working class. They're still very much part. Of the uh, of the class struggle in in Britain as a whole, it's not it's not totally separate and distinct. So um, what goes on throughout the rest of Britain, like this huge Palestine movement, for example, that's happening at the minute, the result of you know what kind of uh, what kind of thing is thrown up in opposition to like Keir Starmer and so on, will have an echo in um, in, uh, in in Scotland. But um, what is the uh, what, to, to to conclude, I guess, my final sort of point? Like, what is the what's the task of, of communists then for for us? in this, uh, this situation, this particular juncture right now. Well, I think it's worth, because of uh, the, the timing of this uh, event, going back and, 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 uh, and using as our touchstone the figure of uh, John McLean. So it's uh, the end of this month on the 30th of November is the centenary of John McLean's death, he died in 1923. Now, John McLean is one of the greatest revolutionaries, one of the greatest Marxists and communists that Britain has ever produced. Um, his uh, honorific title is the Scottish Lenin, um, for, for, for many reasons. You know, he was a representative of the early Soviet Republic in Britain. Um, I think he was like an honorary president or something like that of the, of the Comintern. Um, he was a very brave internationalist. You know, he faced uh, charges of sedition and imprisonment, where his mental and physical health was destroyed by conditions there. Um, and uh, he, like I say, he was a brave internationalist. He opposed this, the, the First World War. Um, in very clear internationalist terms, while many, of course, in, in the British Labour movement, um, obviously sided with imperialism. And he saw the need as well, after this kind of period, for the working class to very decisively break with, you know, its kind of liberal and, and labour reformism of the past, and instead to fight for communism in Britain. He was the er one of the earliest and first representatives, really, of, 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 uh, of communism or of Bolshevism uh, in Britain. Now, McLean, John McLean, out of uh, impatience, with um, English workers, I guess, and with uh, the kind of left-wing sects that were forming the early Communist Party. Um, you know, he advocated a separate path for Scotland, uh, uh, you know, a separate Scottish party and a separate Scottish revolution, I guess, I don't really know. But, um, and we, you know, we have to say this, on this, Maclean was wrong, um, clearly. Like I said, the destiny of the Scottish working class is still very much tied to, um, to the class struggle across the whole of Britain. Um, you know, workers north and south of the border, you know, they, uh, they, they have a common enemy in the British capitalist class. Um, 
and that's a kind of common struggle. So, so the task of, of communists then um, was to build an all Britain you know, communist party. And that is still our same task today, I think, is to build an all British um, communist party. Uh, well, to build an international communist party, of course. Um, but unlike then, unlike in Maclean's day, however, um, Scottish self-determination, the question of independence, is, which is what this is all really about, um, it is a key question in Scotland and in Scottish politics and, and therefore in British politics uh, more broadly. Uh, it's a democratic question, of course, it's not a, a, a socialist one in that sense, um, but it's one through which the working class in Scotland expresses a lot of its opposition basically to the British state, the British ruling class and, and the status quo. And for that, it maintains huge uh, importance in terms of the, the developing consciousness of, of, of the revolutionary working class. Like Maclean, you know, we are communist internationalists above all else. Um, you know, we're not left nationalists or, or like PB nationalists, petty bourgeois democrats. Um, and you know, the, the, the two great things that Lenin taught us all about the national question is that every national question is concrete. Of course, we have to analyze it concretely. Um, but also that with every national question, what is common about them is that as Marxists and as communists, we approach it from the, uh, the point of view of the interests of the proletarian uh, re international revolution. So for that reason, I guess to echo John McLean, we can say all hail the Scottish Workers' Republic and all hail the Revolutionary Communist Party. That brings us to the end of another episode of Marxist Voice, so thanks for listening. But before you go, a few announcements. First, if this talk has made you want a revolutionary antidote to the reformless reformism of the SNP, then look no further than In Defense of Lenin, a new biography of the great revolutionary which delves into his life and development, including his position on the national question, which was, ultimately, vital for the success of the Russian Revolution. Go to Well Read Books to get your copy, link in the show notes below. Secondly, if you agree with Sean, then you should get involved in the practical struggle to build a revolutionary organization which can fight for communism and a Scottish workers' republic. And that means joining the Revolutionary Communist Party, which will have its founding congress in just one month. Go to communist.red to join and to donate to our party launch fund of £20,000. You should also go to shop.communist.red to get your hands on the papers, posters and stickers which will help you establish a communist cell in your area. Link to both of these in the show notes. That's all for this week, but we'll be back soon with another episode of Marxist Voice, podcast of the communists in Britain.